Well, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. You're very welcome to this Dublin Festival of History event. The Dublin Festival of History is an annual free festival brought to you by Dublin City Council, and it's organised by Dublin City Libraries in cooperation with the Dublin City Council Culture Company. And we're delighted to be having in-person events uh, again here in Dublin Castle. I want to thank our colleagues, uh, our friends in Dublin Castle and the OPW for their hospitality. And we're also uh, live streaming the event on YouTube, so welcome to all those who are watching online. Before we begin, just want to remind you that when you, uh, you do need to wear a face covering while in the building, except when you're seated here in the auditorium, I would ask you also to maintain social distancing when moving about the venue. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end, but we don't have any uh, handheld microphones not allowed to use them this year, so we have fixed microphones in the aisles. And if you are asked, uh, want to ask a question, uh, we'll direct you to the nearest microphone. Just uh, watch out for us, uh, but there will be time for questions at the end. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, event, LGBTQ Plus and Public History, with Sarah Phillips, Richard O'Leary, Morris J. Casey, and Kate Renan. Sarah R. Phillips is a trans activist working globally. She's been involved with trans activism for over 25 years, and she's currently in her ninth year as chair of the board of directors of Ireland's national trans organization, the Transgender Equality Network Ireland, and she's the founder, researcher, and archivist of the Irish Trans Archive. Sarah was honored as a Dublin Pride Grand Marshal in 2018, uh, she's also a board member of the National Women's Council of Ireland and the treasurer of both the International Trans Fund in New York and Transgender Europe in Berlin. Dr. Richard O'Leary is a visiting scholar in history at Queen's University, Belfast, and a professional storyteller. He was the coordinator of the Northern Ireland LGBT Heritage Project until May uh, this year. And Richard has decades of experience as a gay activist and as an academic, but in recent years he's focused on sharing stories of LGBTQ plus history through live oral performance and storytelling. His next show is called Border Fairies, and it opens as part of the Outpost Queer Art Festival in Belfast in mid-November. Dr. Morris J. Casey is the historian in residence at, historian in residence at EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum, and the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. He's the cura curator of Out in the World, Ireland's LGBTQ plus diaspora. That's an exhibition running until December this year at EPIC in the CHQ building down there in the Keys. And he completed his PhD in history at the University of Oxford in 2020. And finally, Kate Renan has been part of the education team at the National Gallery of Ireland for eight years. She introduced and developed LGBTQIA plus programming at the gallery, including the management of Outing the Past, Festival of LGBT History in Dublin in 2019. And Kate is the co-founder of the Queer Culture Archive. I'll be back to say a few words at the very end, but in the meantime, please welcome your panel. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, this is uh, a wonderful opportunity to, to uh, chat with you about um, queer Irish history. Um, obviously, thank you to Brendan for introducing my co-panelists, Kate, uh, Morris, and Richard. Um, today, we're going to talk about um, some of the issues that uh, we come across about trying to share our histories, about where we find them, etc. And I would argue that LGBT histories are yet to be extensively researched. I think there's a lot of work going on at the moment. The Irish Queer Archive uh, sits within the National Library and is still most for best part inaccessible. And a post-marriage equality world assumes that the LGBT community have achieved equality and all is right with the world for us. It also assumes that all our stories are the same and that is far from the truth. Um, the true history of the LGBT community is still to be told. Experiences of our emigrants, of gay Christians, the transgender community, the AIDS generation, and those who didn't fit that neatly into that cozy box of marriage equality message are still to be discussed. So how do we address this? Where are these stories and what has been the effect on the broader understanding of the LGBT struggle without them? So hopefully we can tackle some of these questions today and, and hopefully a little bit more. And if you do have questions, please don't be afraid to come up and ask at the end. There will be some time for questions. 
So I'm going to broadly put out a question to my fellow panelists um, about how each of you found yourselves uh, in this specific area of uh, research, and maybe you could provide a little bit of background of how you share uh, your findings. Maybe, Richard, I'd come to you first. Um, thank you, Sarah. I, um, I had an earlier career as an academic, and I worked with statistics and surveys, and including the um, census of population. And I realized that I never appeared in the data that I was analyzing. So I would be analyzing the census, and I didn't appear in the census because um, LGBT weren't recorded. Or I would be conducting or analyze large survey census, uh, data, and I didn't appear because I didn't ask a question on sexual orientation. Um, and I um, actually left academia to become a carer for my late same-sex partner. And I decided not to return to my old life. And um, I'd always been interested in history, but I realized that so much of my gay history, which I, sh I shared with many other people, was actually my own house. So I can see that, Sarah, you've put up an image, which I'll be talking about later, which actually is one of my objects. And um, because um, I'm not a hoarder, I call myself a collector. <laughs> and I, um, I have hundreds of documents and ephemera which um, describe my life, but which for most of my life, I'm an older gay man, I grew up and came out under criminalization that so much of my life could not be shared in public. And um, so um, I then decided that I wanted to talk more <laughs> and talk in public. And I chose not to do it in a conventional academic way, but to do it, one, through storytelling. And I come from a family where storytelling uh, was something that was practiced, so it's, it's a form that I'm comfortable with. But also, um, I um, felt that it was a form which was um, part of what we did in our own community because LGBT people told each other stories. And I also decided I wanted to do it in a visual way because as I think Mike was mentioned in the introduction, um, um, I do what I call fairy storytelling, because I self-identify as a fairy. And um, when um, people say they don't believe in fairies, and say, where's the evidence? Well, if you actually produce objects or ephemera, people find it hard to deny that you exist. And um, so I, I, the form that I use to tell stories and to tell LGBT history it's not just oral storytelling, but it's also visual and material. Uh, and um, that's something which I get satisfaction from, and people who hear and see these stories seem to get satisfaction from it as well. <coughs> I should just mention that uh, I've also used more conventional methods, like I was convener of the um, LGBT Heritage Project in Northern Ireland, you know, which collects oral histories and um, maybe shares LGBT history in a, in a way that um, more people will be familiar with. Great, hey, thanks. Thanks, Richard. Morris, yeah. would you like to? Uh, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so how I came to work he in this area, uh, I describe myself really as a historian of radical politics and progressive movements in the 20th century, and I focus primarily on Ireland and the Irish abroad. Um, and even more specifically within that area of political history, what I'm really interested in is how intimate relationships shape political engagement. So who you're friends with, who you fall in love with, how does that shape the ideas you hold and the revolutions you choose to, be, to participate within? Um, and that really is how I, I came to this history. I think it's important to acknowledge that I'm not myself a member of the LGBTQ plus community, and I think that can lead to me having certain research blind spots for sure. 
but really what I'm trying to do throughout my career is to understand the Irish history um, from the, the viewpoints of different marginalised communities on each stage through Ireland's historical journey, but within the country and, and within the diaspora. And I think a lot of it comes from my experience of uh, going back to my undergrad days of going into the archives, particularly the kind of transformative experience of going into the Irish Queer Archive in the National Library and looking at these documents and saying, wow, people lived these incredibly exciting lives um, that are so rich and so complex and multifaceted and feeling that that richness wasn't necessarily reflected in some of the histories that were being told or were being shared. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, more recently, the, the work that I've done um, has looked at, uh, through my role at EPIC, the Irish Immigration Museum, we curate an exhibition out in the world, Ireland's LGBTQ plus diaspora. And that's uh, been a new way of sort of sharing history for me, sharing it through an exhibition. But again, I've done a lot of the kind of conventional academic stuff, peer reviewed papers, articles, this kind of stuff. And for my sins, I've spent quite a lot of time sharing things on Twitter. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it's been really wonderful for me to be involved in this historical world and I think I've learned so much both from the contemporary community and through looking at history through this queer lens as well. It's shaped not only my work specifically on, on activism but even my work on the 1920s and the 1930s all adopts those, those lenses and those frameworks. Okay. Um, <laughs> my beautiful uh, nosedive into LGBT history research uh, started in sort of late 2017, early 2018, the um, Into Teachers Union, they have an LGBT group and they contacted me only a few months after I'd started my permanent role in the National Gallery of Ireland and they asked if I could do an LGBT themed tour of the national collection there. Uh, I was basically just looking for an excuse to legitimately make a part of my job and this was the perfect excuse. So I did the research, used them as guinea pigs, they were so very kind and I was so very nervous. Um, but that then grew, from their feedback, it grew into a public tour, which then has sort of blossomed into this massive LGBT strand of programming from the education department in the National Gallery. Um, I, sorry, that makes it sound like it was not planned. I have a five-year plan. I'm on track. It's great. Um, but it's tours, talks, uh, workshops, uh, community engagement. We currently have an exhibition up. Uh, called Queer Mind, Body and Soul. It's a collection of artworks by 16 LGBTQ plus gender non-conforming young people and their allies who worked with us through a Goshka program called Like-Minded. Um, all 16 of them are my absolute heroes. They know this, I've said it to them many times. But their artworks are incredible and so powerful, it's only up for another week, that's why I'm plugging it like straight out the gate before I forget. Um, but it's, I wanted the full program to be based in the collection, um, but also based in the community. So everything we've done at all stages of the programming over the past three years is based on feedback from the community um, at all stages, which has been great. Uh, but then out of that research, I also kind of discovered that while doing it, a lot of the time it's very hard to find the resources um, in terms of like academic resources, archival resources, and what sort of steered me was that feedback from the community. And it was kind of piecemeal in that people say in the gallery were helping me, people on tours and talks were helping me, um, but I wanted it to be a bit more cohesive. So with the help of Judith Finley, uh, we co-founded Queer Culture Ireland, whose or original aim was to connect people to further research into LGBTQIA plus history. But uh, it has now grown into something much larger, which is great. So now we also do exhibitions and um, talks, workshops, um, and but its main focus is to connect people and to keep the research alive, to keep it growing, and to evolve it as much as possible. Great. Um, I think for myself, I think I, I uh, mirror a little bit of Richard's experience. My own kind of background comes from collecting a lot of information that, in a way, back in the 1970s, late 70s and 80s, I was looking for um, you know, my tribe. So if you saw a newspaper article or whatever, magazine article, whatever, you were collecting it, and I was keeping them in certain... I, I'm like you, they're not, I'm not a hoarder, I'm a collector. <laughs> um, so in a lot of ways, it was about trying to reflect my own experience in, my, in the ability not to be able to come out at that point, but also in the future be able to come out. And I think a lot of those, because again, for the trans community, there was very little evidence of us uh, out there. There was very little within the media, there was very little... Uh, on the national airwaves or the television. And there were some, there was some great pieces like uh, 
Claire Farrell's interview in 1980 on uh, Summer House Programme on RTE, which is an amazing piece. It's up on the Irish, uh, or on RTE archives, if anyone wants to get a look at it. 20 minutes of solid gold, what it means to be trans in 1980 in Ireland. And we were there, and I think that was my, my, my point. So researching or collecting all of that work, then I realized, well, actually, I ha actually have an archive, and this is something I want to kind of talk about today, that for, for a lot of our parts of our community, most people don't see us as ever existing beyond the more recent time. And I, I want to reflect that in, in my own research in trans community, that actually I go back over 200 years here in Ireland, but also Irish people throughout the diaspora in the 18th and 19th century especially. So f for you, Richard, I, I noticed in one of your comments when you talked about uh, gay Christians in Ireland in the 1980s were like fairies, and like fairies, their existence was ignored by historians. Can you talk a little bit about that, that non-existence within a national realm? We didn't exist. We were shoved under the carpet a little bit, and those histories then are a lot harder to find, and how the work that you were doing to try and make them more public and talk about them, and that storytelling piece reflects with the work that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I actually did a, my BA in history at University College Dublin, 1983 to 1986, and there was no mention of LGBT people in the entire three years. In fact, at that time, women were kind of struggling to assert their, um, their history with, 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 within the, um, the discipline. And um, I think it is obviously very significant that, um, you know, we were, until 1993, operating on a situation of criminalization. And criminalization is a great, great way of suppressing, um, suppressing the archive. So, for example, um, um, I spent most of my life in Northern Ireland, and uh, you know, at one po point the police decided to have um, a purge of activists. And uh, when they raided their homes, they took away their diaries, they took away their um, their letters. So, um, in that context, uh, when both the state and also your family, we had to hide things from our, our, our families because there was a real risk and expectation that if we came out to our families, we were going to be thrown out of home or we were going to be cut off. And that wasn't a paranoid fear. I know many people that it happened to, in fact. Uh, so um, there were huge pressures not to, to express. Um, so, you know, that's... Suppressing the evidence. Not to, yeah, uh, to keep the evidence uh, in your... Uh, the evidence base, but also, I think we should call out the discipline. I mean, there were historians, I mean, UCD, who I believe were, were, um, were queer, and are all the ones who were educated people, and they made no effort to give leadership to say there's an area of our history here which has been suppressed. Because much of what, say, Morris is finding in his work in the archives, that material existed 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but the historians turned a blind eye. And we can say that's, you know, partly because particularly um, heterosexual men had an obsession with some areas of history to the detriment of women's history or, 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 or queer history. And, you know, they haven't spoken about that. They haven't spoken, you know, why has it taken so long? And why should it be up to LGBT people to bring this history to attention? Because one of the reasons why it's very important to study, say, the experience of gay Christians is not because you're particularly interested in that group in themselves, but the resources that, in this example, the, the churches mobilized to suppress any unorthodox views on, 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 on gender and sexuality tells you a lot about the institutions and the establishment. The resources that they put in to repress us in our lives and suppress our history tells a lot about them, and that's a good reason for, for, for everyone learning more about LGBT history, because they learn more about their own society and the power structures.
Uh, can, can I just come to you there just to reflect on that a little bit in the sense that some of the work you've been doing in the gallery, for instance, is finding those stories that already existed but didn't necessarily have a queer eye on them before and therefore they weren't looked at within an LGBTQ history. Yeah. But that's something that you've been identifying in some of the work in that, that tour that you're doing. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to the, about that, about why it's important then for our national institutions to search out this history that sometimes already exists in there, mm. but actually nobody has bothered to examine it in the yeah. past. And it's, it's kind of interesting, like the, <laughs> what I first discovered when starting the research was that actually in some cases, some of my colleagues in the gallery, some of the curators had unintentionally done some of the research, but didn't really know what to do with it. So just sort of had it sitting on their hard drives or in their desk somewhere. And when I started doing the research and you know, they became more aware of it, suddenly I started getting emails or phone calls or, or little like folders on my desk of like, hey, did this research a year ago, didn't know where to put it, it's yours now, um, which is great. So all of the sort of gay stuff started just slowly trickling towards me, which is kind of handy. Um, but just sort of to touch on um, what Richard said, that, the, that like sort of um, pressure to almost not niche yourself, I think is still exists in like a historical, or a, a, a research sort of sector, because I, I have had friends who are art historians, um, and I would count myself as a queer art historian, uh, more specifically, but I have had friends, dear close friends, who I love very much, um, and who I work with, who have said to me, now, now you've done that now, time to move on, you don't want to get pigeonholed. And I'm like, no, no, I do want to get pigeonholed, that's the point. Um, I want to keep doing this. I mean, at some point I might want to stop, but that, that pressure, I think, to take the box and move on, I think, still exists. And something I really wanted to do in the gallery was embed it so strongly that if I fell off the face of the earth, it still has to happen. It's not going anywhere. And that's why I started it very slowly in 2018 and built it up over time. And that's actually been really beneficial because it means it's, it's just always going to be there. Um, and it also meant that I didn't get burnout. Well, I did get a bit of burnout, but it wasn't enough that it, it stopped me in any way. Um, so I think that that finding the stories and, and making them consistently part of a cultural institution is so, so important. So that it's not just for pride or it's not just a flash in the pan. Um, and it makes people aware then, as a knock-on effect, what is also still missing from the narratives within the institution. And it also brings the stories to people that would have never come across them. Like I've had people come up to me at the end of tours and say that they didn't know anything about the community, they just wandered in, heard there was a free tour and followed it and suddenly they know loads more about the community. I, I once delivered the tour um, the weekend that the Pope was in town. Whoops, uh, that was a scheduling snafu on my part. But like 10 people showed up, I was so impressed. And we got to the Caravaggio Taking of Christ, which I include on the tour, and sitting in front of it uh, were a priest and a nun. And they were so very respectful. I warned them beforehand, I was like, this is an LGBT tour, just so you're, not, just so you're aware. Um, and they were both just sat there very, very happily and were like, oh, that's fascinating. Oh, okay. yeah. So it was very nice. But that's the great thing about the cult national cultural institutions. <clears throat> the audience walking in the door is so incredibly broad. Um, so you're, you're reaching an audience that often you wouldn't normally get to, which is um, quite unique and a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, and Morris, your, I know with work with Epic, for instance, already embeds a lot of these individual stories because I know my own walk through the actual uh, the exhibition, I was finding a number of trans voices, for instance, they're well-known trans voices, Dr. Barry, uh, Dr. James Barry, Albert Cashier, people like that. But, but also the work that you've been doing more recently around looking at the diaspora, the LGBTQ diaspora, and, and I was conscious uh, the exhibition that you ran during the summer for Pride, but also then the talk that you gave on Thursday night, which I dipped into, uh, about the story of Frank Egan, for instance, and on, based on the research of, and we have to acknowledge Tiernan Egan, the brilliant research here uh, on their family member. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was intrigued that it reflected on our own conversation here the, in preparation for today, that how these stories are, they're really important, but also they can be left out of official narratives. They can be, um, they're forgotten within, you know, the stories that we tell about the LGBTQ community, and yet they are critical to local communities, to families, uh, to minority groups within our own community. And maybe you could talk a little bit about why you feel that the work that you started uh, to do during the summer, for instance, to reach out looking for these, these people around the world, mm -hmm. and again, people like Frank, for instance, their, their stories 
sh need to be told and reflected within within our, our culture and within our wider, broader national institutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot there to think about. And I'm also thinking <clears throat> about uh, what Richard raised some really interesting things about the nature of evidence. And I think, Richard, when you mentioned this idea of someone being raided and their diary being taken and how that reflects and how they enter the historical narrative, right? That person, the diary in which they could have spoke about their sexuality on their own terms is taken away and they enter history as a police record. They enter history as, mm. a, as a criminal. And that, this, those differences were, were really important to me when I was structuring out in the world and thinking about it in relation to particularly histories that already exist in the museum and how I wanted to do something a little different. So for example, in the museum, we have Dr. James Barry. Um, and in the exhibition, I feature Michael Dillon, um, who was a, a trans healthcare pioneer of the 1960s. And the distinction between those two stories for me is that we know about Dr. James Barry's trans identity because his posthumous wishes for his body not to be analyzed in a post-mortem were betrayed. Those wishes were betrayed. Michael Dillon wrote a memoir. So he enters the historical record on his own terms. He chooses to say, this is who I am. That was really important for me. Everyone in the exhibition, whether they are um, someone from the 19th century or someone who I'm in email contact with, in a way, I, I adopt this idea of, of kind of a trans historical consent. Everyone in the exhibition entered into the historical record talking about their sexuality on their own terms. And I think that collecting the stories uh, more recently, I've been thinking more and more about that, about how progress for LGBTQ plus civil rights is so important for future histories. And this event that we did on Thursday, where Tiernan Arnab Egan, uh, their uncle was a man named Frank Egan. Frank Egan was part of a very uh, well-known gay squat in Brixton in the 1980s. And I found a note when the exhibition launched in June saying Frank Egan was my uncle. And Tiernan had left this note and I got in touch with Tiernan and asked Tiernan, will you share your uncle's story? And they did, and it was wonderful. And it's, it's an amazing example of how you can just take this one note and you can have someone come and, and talk for an hour at length about who this person was. And you can take someone from just that little snippet and, and flesh out an entire life, an entire history, an entire character, and a complex character, not someone who's a kind of canonical hero, someone who's quite complicated, complex. And it made me think of how what was important to Tiernan's own research into their uncle was that their father um, accepted Frank. Their father was, um, you know, loved Frank. And it's that idea of family acceptance that also allows stories to be told. So there's, it's the family acceptance that means that if someone passes away, a box of love letters doesn't get thrown in a skip. It's mm -hmm. those, that, this, the acceptance that we have now in wider society will be really important for stories going forward. And I think that those questions of, of evidence and how it allows us to share stories in people's own words are really one, of, one of the stories that, that, that actually reflected for me within Frank's story was not just that the father, or he, like Tiernan's father actually accepted Frank, but actually Tiernan's father supported Frank, actually went to London to support Frank during a court case. And, and it was only through this research that Tiernan found out this uh, story that actually that not only they had a queer member of their family, but also that the queer member that was accepted to a certain degree by, uh, by their sibling. And so we, like, I think a lot of these stories, and it's, again, my own reflection around, with my own research within the trans community is very much around stories, people's stories, people's uh, own experience and how it reflects on a broader history and a broader narrative. And I think, so, so going back to that, I would like to just come to kind of, we prepared uh, some small stories to talk about today in, in preparation here, because I think something that Richard said very early on is around this ephemera that we collect, this, this evidence that we collect, and so therefore we're going to talk a little bit for a few minutes about some of those experiences. And I, I, you mentioned, Richard, that there's a big picture stuck up behind you uh, for the last uh, half an hour. Um, so yeah, so maybe you'd like to introduce to us what this, this uh, picture means and what, what's the background behind it. Yeah, and... Um you know, when I studied history and the emphasis was on, you know, written documents in the archives, and then I found that, you know, for gay men, the written records were criminal records, 
and for you know lesbian and bi women it was a separate issue of of uh, invisibility um, so I found that um you know we have to you know have different ways of, of, of doing queer history and for me I've put a great emphasis on objects and ephemera and note I don't call them props because these are these are my personal objects and these have huge personal significance for me but also they can tell us a lot about queer history um, I've put this one up because um, uh, it's a Valentine's car that I gave to my late partner and I know the year was 1996 because I wrote on it happy and a sixth anniversary. So we met in 1989, so this would have been 1996. And this tells you something about queer time because in a situation where our long-term loving relationships were not recognized, there was no possibility of civil partnership or marriage, we had to make up our own anniversary dates. So we actually met around Valentine's Day in 1989. So we declared Valentine's Day to be our anniversary. Whereas other couples you know, would have a date that they had maybe a legal um, 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 uh, ceremony. And also it's indicative of the fact that it wasn't that easy to find same-sex Valentine cards. Um, I mean, I would have had one of these for every year from 1989 to 2013. So obviously this was one that I found that reflected something about a same-sex relationship. And um, I think also I probably chose it at the time because of toothbrushes. And that tells you something about the time period, uh, the mid-90s, because I remember there was an incident when my late partner, who I have difficulty describing as my late husband because, because the Irish state took so long to bring in equal civil marriage he died before it was possible. So I'm not legally allowed in law to refer to that man as my late husband. But um, there was a day when I think I, f I couldn't find my toothbrush and I went to use his toothbrush and he said, you can't use my toothbrush because of HIV. And There was something then about seeing um, and the possibility, he, he wasn't positive, but the possibility of being positive, about having two toothbrushes next to each other in physical contact was a very powerful image for me. But when you open the card, um, I realized that all the cards that I wrote to my partner, we used initials. And I think it was because from day one, in the context of criminalization, we got into the habit, if we were in public, of referring to each other by initials, just like other gay men, particularly older gay men, would refer to other gay men by a female name. So even the way that we communicate to each other was affected by the context of decriminalization. So if some historian came across this card, they wouldn't know who M is, they wouldn't know who R is, they wouldn't know why they use initials, they wouldn't know why a sixth anniversary. Um, and that's when this also illustrates how LGBT persons are a unique position to tell their own stories, especially around ephemera, because there is so much um, you know, emotion and context that we can elaborate when we're allowed to tell our own stories and uh, I find objects um, a, a, a way that works for me and hopefully for, for listeners as well. Very good. Thank you for sharing that and especially considering it's such a personal story as well. Um, Kate, uh, your slide, yeah. very grand, <laughs> fabulous <laughs> pictures coming out of the National Gallery. Ooh, yep. <laughs> Yeah, Perks working in the gallery, you get these big grand portraits to play with. Um, also, you get to play with interpretation a little bit, but this one is a little bit more cut and dry. Um, so this is a portrait of the Vera Foster family by William Orpen, um, who features very heavily in our collection. And 
Also, what features in our collection is all the archival material from his work, including the little sketch and note on the right-hand side. Um, so it's actually a letter he wrote to his wife while he was working in Clyde Court in Louth, painting the Vere Foster family. Uh, it had been arranged by Hugh Lane. Um, Hugh Lane is another potentially queer figure in history that just seems to have puppet strings on everyone. I love the bits. But um, this time he'd arranged for Orpen to go paint the Vere Foster family. Uh, they'd lived in Clyde Court since the 18th century, quite a well-to-do family. Um, the father, Augustus Vere Foster, and the mother was um, Charlotte Folks. Unfortunately, it wasn't a very happy household. It was quite fractious. They lived quite separate lives, even though they were living under the same roof, and it wasn't a very settled home. Um, possibly because, well, sort of, Orpen writes about it, but possibly because they just, it wasn't a very happy marriage in general. But the eldest child, who you see here on the left, in the brown britches and who's drawn in Orpen's sketch, um, later known as John, uh, was forced by um, his mother to wear this brown dress rather than the britches that he actually wanted to wear, which is in the sketch on the right-hand side. And Orpen was fascinated by John, um, basically sort of spending a lot of time with him and hanging out with him. And in this little note, writes to his wife about how he's kind of shocked and surprised that the family won't just let John wear his britches. Um, obviously, at the time, John was being referred to by she, her pronouns, and the name they'd been assigned at birth. Uh, so later on, many years later, um, John eventually left the household in 1962 and went to go live with his cousin, Evelyn Folks, um, in a town nearby, and kind of unfortunately became a bit of a, I don't know, a, a sight to be seen, I guess, in this small town. Um, this sort of unusual figure dressed in men's clothing with short cropped hair, but actually originally from the, the well-to-do house around the corner. And the, the house and the estate eventually went to John's younger sister, who's there in the little the frills and the hat after she was married. Um, so it's an, kind of an interesting story of, of a trans figure in history that's kind of forgotten. Um, but also, obviously, when we're talking about queer history, language that would not have probably been used by these people, um, that they would not have been familiar with, and I'm always very conscious of that. They were using modern terminology for historical figures, um, but it's more just to make it accessible to a contemporary audience um, and to make it a little easier to explain, I guess. Uh, but yeah, John is, John is a great character, not one I often get to talk about on the tours because the portrait and the sketch are not on display. So anytime someone asks for a PowerPoint presentation or something like that, I, I tend to lean a bit more heavily on our archival material because they're a little trickier to, to take out. Um, and there is still loads that I haven't researched in the collection, which is great. Um, but yeah, that's one little story. <coughs> Yeah, for many, for many of those kind of trans stories that I come across, they're very much hidden back into mm -hmm. this is something just not to be talked about a lot yeah. of the time. Um, Morris, you've brought us along uh, yeah. a photograph. Um, so a, this uh, photograph is from the Irish Times in 1937. There's quite a long, large story behind it, but the, the brief version is Chester Arthur, who's there being pointed to the red arrow, Ch his full title was Chester Allen Arthur III, and he was the grandson of the, fir of the 21st president of the US, Chester Allen Arthur I. And he arrived in Ireland in 1921, um, intending just a brief visit, but he became involved in the Irish Revolution. Uh, he supported the uh, Irish Republicans during the Civil War, and he also was engaged to a woman, and he also had an affair with uh, Edward Carpenter, uh, uh, the kind of godfather of gay rights figure in Britain during these years as well. And Arthur also developed this idea that he might one day um, include a sexual revolution within the Irish Revolution, and, and wrote about these theories of human sexuality during the 1920s. His um, reception when he first arrived in Dublin in 1921 was hosted by Kathleen O'Brennan, uh, who was a Irish Republican, the sister-in-law of Eamon Kant, one of the signatories of the proclamation. And in the years after the First World War, during the 1920s, she was in a relationship with Marie Equi, who was an Irish-Italian radical in the US. And this image is of Chester Arthur's first return to Ireland after he'd become disillusioned with the idea of a sexual revolution in Ireland in the late 1920s. And he returns to Ireland in 1937 with his second wife, Esther Murphy, who's um, an Irish-American woman who uh, was uh, born into this very wealthy Irish-American Catholic family. In fact, her brother was a model for a character in an F. Scott Fitzgerald novel. 
and Esther Murphy was involved in lesbian circles in Paris in the 1920s. So this one photo, and you look through newspapers and newspapers as a historian, and you come across photos like this, and they appear to you as quite kind of drab and dry and boring. But this one photo captures so much Irish LGBTQ plus diaspora history. And I actually wrote my PhD thesis on the world of, of Irish radicalism in the 1920s and 1930s. And I spent three and a half years on this, and I never heard the name Chester Arthur. And it was only when I started doing this exhibition and started looking at this history with this lens of Irish LGBTQ plus diaspora that I realized he was there all along on the sidelines of sources. And that showed to me the potential of just accepting the possibility of this history, how that opens up these stories, just thinking, looking at a, a period that's been poured over and thinking there must be queer histories here. And then you can find them in many cases, yeah. Thank you, Morris. And I think, I think also it kind of uh, reflects that for me, a lot of these stories are hidden somewhere, but yet they're hidden in open view a lot of the time. It reflects a lot of my own research around trans histories, especially when I go back into the 19th or 18th century where you're looking for these stories. And it's very difficult because you can't just put in search words or for transgender or trans or transsexual, which are more recent words, but you have to go look at them in a very different way. And for me, a lot of it is around not necessarily putting those labels on people, but using, for in my case, words like gender variant and looking at that gender variance. So for simple, like similar to Kate's story about the Devere Fosters, you know, John is very much of somebody who is gender variant, but as to how John describes himself, we're not sure. We don't even know how John uses pronouns as such. And this is something that the trans community consistently use language today but when you start researching these stories, it's very difficult to go looking for even words like homosexual, uh, et cetera, or gay don't exist in these a lot of the time. And so for me, like I, I brought along just a simple piece of uh, uh, which I'm currently researching. It's a simple story around a young person living in Rap Mines in 1881 who was in their early 20s um, and goes to uh, London to study art arrives home and there's quite a lot of kerfuffle around the area, around Rap Mines at the time, because uh, they have arrived back in a different gender than they had actually left. And that it transpires that for the first 23 years of their life, they had been presenting as female and living that life in very much uh, a out way. They were socializing, they were seen and recorded as being beautiful and uh, accomplished in various different things, in tennis and music, etc. but actually go to study art in, in London and arrive back and the mum eventually, uh, mother announces that actually her daughter is actually her son. Uh, now we're not sure what actually reflects this just now, whether the daughter has become the son or whether the son was always a son, and that's something I'm trying to work at the moment. In fact, I think I've located the family at this point, but I'm not 100% sure, there's still a little bit of doubt about it. But it's about that gender variance that happened in society generally that is, makes it that much more difficult, first of all, to research it, but also the fact that it is nothing unusual. These stories were happening throughout, the, especially the 19th century, within my own research. I have 37 of these at the moment, and they're not the, accepting people like Dr. James Barry, Albert Cashier, Edward Lacey Evans, these sort of individuals. They're actually more smaller, more uh, uh, unknown stories. You know, I mean, I was, I was given a story um, by, um, uh, uh, what's the chap in, in Brian? Um, from, no, from the, the Kilmainham jail, sorry. Crowley. Brian Crowley, sorry, my apologies. Um, about a story of a young person who had been taken in for vagrancy and again had been living their life as a young boy for years, for throughout their whole life. Their mother had died and now they were uh, brought into the jail for vagrancy and it transpired that actually their gender identity was actually female. Um, but they did not know how to live that gender identity because they'd been brought up as a boy throughout those years. So again, I think the, the 
looking for these stories, from my example, is much more complicated and a little bit harder to try and uh, find, but they're there. And I think for the trans community, the work I'm trying to do is to try and prove and show that, that we've been here all along, that our stories are there, that our histories are there, and even that actually at a time when the, for instance, the gay community in Ireland back in the early 70s and uh, late 70s was starting to take, uh, come together and create a community, actually the trans community was doing the same thing, albeit in a much more shadowed way, in a much more quieter way. We were starting to form our own groups as well. The Friends of Ian forms in 1978 at the same time as the Hirschfield Centre is starting to open up, et cetera. And that's another day's work. You can come and listen to some of those stories at another stage. I'm conscious of time, so I just want to kind of move on a little bit and thank you for sharing them. But if anyone wants to check out some of these stories, obviously you will find uh, Morris's work and Richard's work and Kate's work um, you know, around the internet a lot of the time, but also we, talk, we do talk quite a lot of, of uh, do a lot of talks around this area. And um, just I want to go back to one last kind of a two last quick questions. Um, and this kind of reflects, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the future. As, as a society, we've come to accept the traditional narratives of, you know, that are presented through history books, through historians, through even the national institutions that we talked about. You know, and yet we've always been a nation of storytelling, as, as Richard mentioned earlier. And yet those stories don't always get recognized for their importance sometimes because they're, as I said earlier, they're more important to localities, to families, or to minorities. Can I ask any of you, which one, any of you want to come in about this, are there consequences to those blind spots, to those areas that we don't, those stories we don't hear, that reflect on a wider Irish history rather than just um, you know, LGBT history? I'm talking about, for instance, Dr. Mary McAuliffe's work, for instance, around the women of 1916, and also that key piece that for a lot of them, a lot of them were LGBT from what we can see. And, and yet not only were the women's stories written out, but also that LGBTQ story was written out as well. And are we, is that happening now in the last 30, 40 years as well, as we start to document what's gone on and that social change that's happened in Ireland, especially in more recent years? Somebody like to come in on that? It's a very broad question. <laughs> um. I'll go. Uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's a, we were, yeah, we were kind of talking about it a little bit beforehand, but the, as I was saying, like in the gallery, the, the research I've been doing at the moment with LGBT history has definitely brought up broader questions about the other narratives we're missing in the collection. Now, as I was saying to somebody recently, the handy thing about a national collection when it's art is you get to interpret all the things in a variety of ways, which is a huge amount of fun. Um, and the fact that the word interpretation is in my title also adds a lot of fun. But um, it's something that the national cultural institutions really need to address, that the archive material is there, the parts of the collections are there. Just there's a, um, a, a habit, I think, to lean on the narratives that have been deemed popular or important. Um, and say, so even in the gallery at the moment, there's a, a, a default, which I am also guilty of sometimes, when somebody asks, say, for a highlights tour, we go Caravaggio, Vermeer, Yeats, and MacLeese, four white cis straight men. Um, whereas, in fact, our collection it is still missing a lot of female narratives. Um, but it is growing and is a lot better when it comes to female re representation. Um, so it's something I'm always tr we're trying to shift that when people come in, they see they we get to show them a broader narrative of Irish and also international history just by the nature of the collection. Um, so it is something we're trying to do and trying to do in, I want to say the right way, but I don't know if there is a right way, but do it in a, a holistic way, I guess. So it's not tokenistic, it's just consistently embedded. Um, but I think that has to come from a cultural institution perspective anyway, from a top down and across all levels. It can't just be one department or one layer of the institution doing it. Um, and luckily, I'm very lucky in the National Gallery, that it's the curators are passionate about it, the archivists are passionate about it, our director is passionate about it. Um, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of our programming and events and exhibitions and all that kind of thing. But um, I think we're, we're getting there. It's just also, 
I love the national cultural institutions, but we're slow. We do things so slowly. Um, so it just takes time, I think. Um, uh, can I come to you, Richard? Just also, you, it was you who mentioned the word blind spot around the possibility that there's stories out there that don't need to necessarily come from the LGBTQ community specifically. You mentioned that there, obviously there's a wider audience that actually can provide some of these stories, as for instance that Tiernan did with, with Frank's story. Yeah. Um, so what I want to say is that um, there are still historians and institutions out there who are, I believe, consciously trying to prevent a great awareness of LGBT history. Um, I say this particularly in relation to um, history of Church of Ireland. Um, uh, a number of books have come out on the Church of Ireland. And, you know, when I was growing up, we thought that the gays were either foreign or Protestants. And yet, uh, a number of books have come out on the Church of Ireland and history of, of Southern Irish Protestants, and you won't find a single queer mentioned among them. And I don't believe that that's accidental. I think that there is a, um, either an unforgivable ignorance or some people make a decision they don't want to talk about it, which actually suits some people within that church institution who do not want that brought up as being part of their, their experience. Um, and the second thing, even within our own recent history, um, you know, there's not agreement as to what happened, for example, in relation to marriage equality. Because you would think that the campaign for marriage equality began maybe 15 years ago. The campaign for marriage equality actually began with conservatives, with people of faith in Ireland, Catholic and Protestant, who wanted recognition for their same-sex monogamous relationships. And, and the early examples of same-sex um, commitment ceremonies are actually church ceremonies, private, illegal, at a time when the more radical members of the gay movement were completely opposed to the idea of, you know, heterosexist marriage. So that's an example of how even the history being written at the moment, I think, needs to be revised. Um, and there's a blind spot there, and there's a blind spot within our community, which is maybe uncomfortable with recognizing that part of how we got here, the origins are in, you know, a faith movement or something which doesn't sit easily with, you know, um, modern um, um, contemporary secular ideas. Yeah, and I think I, I've mentioned this a million times before. I think that reflects also the trans community's own experience of marriage equality at the time it was happening. You know, that obviously that, that story has not been told in the sense that while we celebrated it and we needed it as part of our own gender recognition campaign because there was a divorce clause within our um, uh, rec gender recognition camp or, uh, legislation, it was actually quite a conflicted and complicated uh, experience of marriage equality because our voices were actually silenced uh, quite a lot of the time in it. So these narratives of whether where it starts or even how it ends is actually quite uh, difficult in its left. Morris, would you like to add anything there? Yeah, I'd just say quickly, so hopefully we can have a few, chance for a few audience yeah. questions. What's thinking through blind spots and this history, I think um, what people both on stage here and more broadly are addressing is that Irish queer history is not just something that happens in the 1970s and 1990s, right? There's a queer history of the revolution. There's a queer history of emigration. It's about showing how it's intertwined with all aspects of the national narrative. And I think creating the public awareness of that fact is the, a really important frontier of this public history. Yeah, just, just before to, I, I, we go to questions, I just want to kind of uh, reflect on a comment you put in an Irish Times article about Michael Dillon back in June around something Dillon said about if we do not know ourselves, how shall we ever know anyone else? But I also think sometimes we need to reflect on that about how is everyone else going to know us? You know, so I think we need to know ourselves as much as we expect everybody else to know it. But I do think, again, something that Richard said as well within our preparation here is that our histories are not just, they don't just come from us. There is a wider audience out there. So if, if those stories resonate in the wider uh, heterosexual 
uh, part of the community or part of society, those stories can also be shared and brought in and told. Because again, it reflects on you know, whether the fact that Tiernan happens to be part of our community, that could have been just still part of Frank's family, Frank Egan's family, who was researching their uncle. Um, and I think it's very much about trying to bring all of these stories that are out there that we all know and can share and bring them in and broaden out that more colorful history of LGBT history. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for, uh, I mean, I know we've talked a lot of, over these conversations before and we could go on all day, but I'm conscious of time, so I will go to the audience at this point. Um, uh, Brendan's at the, at the end there with a camera, or sorry, with a, a microphone. Uh, if anybody has a question, uh, could you direct it towards the microphone, please? Um, thank you so much for sharing the stories. And speaking about reaching broader audiences, what do you think is the role of the education system in that, in reaching broad audiences? Ooh, can I go? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's something that uh, I, would, I would love to and have talked to shout out about before, but um, a, a huge amount, I think, of, of what can be done and maybe hopefully, or will one day be done, is embedding the narratives in the, the school system in Ireland. There's, I would kind of say, though, that there are bigger issues in the Irish school system to be fixed, possibly first, the main one being sex, sex education. Um, I think if that is fixed first, then there's more space, I think, for LGBTQ plus narratives. Um, or simultaneously, all at the same time, also an option. Um, but yeah, I think in a beautiful ideal world, they would be embedded. I mean, you, you can see it in Scotland, it's already happening, and there's amazing work being done in the rest of the UK as well. Um, and it, you know, we could definitely take a lead from that, but I think the Irish school system is still a good bit behind that. I think it would take a fairly massive leap for it to happen in the next, say, three or five years. Um, but it is something definitely that we should be working towards, I think, 100%. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's such a big problem within the school system anyway yeah. for, that broader um, acceptance of the LGBT community within the school system yeah. because we are still very much, um, most of our school system is run by the church. Yeah. Let's be very clear here. And therefore there's a reluctance to even bring in education around sex education, et cetera, or even stories around uh, LGBT uh, histories, even more recent histories, yeah. they're all excluded. So it's, it's quite a lot of, uh, it's quite a difficult place to kind of experience. I know within uh, Transgender Equality Network Ireland, Tenny, we struggle to even get into the school to talk to support young trans people uh, who are coming out, you know, at 14, 15, 16 years of age. So trying to get the history in there is much more difficult. I think one thing I would reflect is that quite a lot of colleges are open to hearing these histories and are quite open to bringing in historians to talk and share these stories where I think trying to get it into the, especially the second level uh, school system curriculum is very difficult at the moment. I, I should highlight though that, um, that I, I also volunteer with Shoutout and have been working with them on a, a subcommittee group to uh, rejig their presentations to schools. So they, they reach hundreds of schools every year, which is incredible. But um, the, part of the reason that we're, they're rejigging the content is because the actual students are more up on LGBTQ plus awareness than <laughs> school systems are. Um, so we're catching up, but also we have embedded queer history in that. Now, obviously actually putting that into a 40 minute presentation is very difficult when you have a whole host of other things to cover, but it's at least highlighting the fact that queer people have always been here. Um, so that I think is a step in the right direction. Again, obviously that is not in any way across the board. It is entirely selective by the schools that bring shout out mm. into their uh, spaces, but um, I think it is a step in the right direction and hopefully will lead to more engagement and also more awareness with young people as well in schools, hopefully. Yes. Has anyone else got a question? Just waiting for a race to the microphone. like. And the race yes. is on. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? It's uh, to the lady here. Is it Kate? Yeah. So it was just an observation. You know when you do your tour, mm. and at the end of it, the Caravaggio, mm. and you said there was a nun and there was a priest there, <laughs> yeah. and you had to apologize in advance. I, I, I didn't apologize. I, there was no apology. Uh, it was just a, I just well, wanted to flag. Why would you warn them? 
I don't see why you would warn them. That's all I gotta say. Fair, no, fair point. Um, yeah, I think I just, uh, I don't know, they were maybe just so sweet and polite. Um, I wanted to just, also we were standing very much in front of them and blocking their way. Um, I do often warn people in general on tours if we're about to, because there's benches in front of the paintings. So often I just say, we'll only be here for five minutes. You can follow us if you like. Um, but yeah, it was not an apology, definitely, definitely not an apology, um, but just a flag. Yeah, warn them, that's true, I did, yeah. I think the, the old Catholic guilt rose up in me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, that's me told. Sorry, did we? <laughs> cool. Did um, we have another question? Yeah. Uh, sorry, just I, I think we're at a crux in our history in the sense of our modern aspect of our history. There are individuals in our community who were there at the days of the early 1970s and that when the modern um, campaigns kind of began to take off. But they're getting older and the chances to get their stories and to record their uh, memories of the events that took place uh, is, is slipping away from us. I look around this room and I see faces of individuals who were there um, at the very early stages of things. Um, and I see how they, like myself, have grown older. Um, and I, would, uh, I think it would be very sad if we lost their stories. So if that's one thing. And the other thing, just to say that I think it's wonderful that we have this mix of, uh, if you like, professional academics uh, and historians and the, the talented amateur who's out there collecting our history because there's so many aspects of it that need to be collected. I had the recent experience of bringing a founding director of a very crucial and central and one of the longest running uh, uh, gay services in Ireland to a volunteer training day and none of them had a clue who he was. They didn't know who, that he, they didn't know his name, they didn't know that he was the founding director of their organization, nothing like that at all. They had a completely misunderstanding of the history of their organization. And when something like that's able to happen, that should be something that scares us all because our history is vital. We can't move forward without understanding where we've come from and valuing where we've come from and the achievements that we have made. When you look at what we have done as a community in this country where a culture actively worked against us and you look around the world where they have been working for a lot longer in far more liberal societies and they haven't made as much of the progress that we have made in this country. And I think that's something that we should be very, very proud of. I think I'd like to just reflect on that comment. I think, absolutely, I agree with, the, you know, it's so important about documenting this and there are so many amazing projects documenting this history as well um, in Ireland. And I think the importance as well is of conceptualizing what's in your own personal archive, um, what might be relevant, having a very broad conception of that, right? And being very open to donating many things. I know the Bishopsgate Institute in London, hmm. a lesbian couple donated their bet, which must be a pain in terms of storage. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really interesting idea, I think, yeah. that the aspects of this history that are worth preserving may not be even ones you think of what's in your own attic, but yeah. you know, it's absolutely just... Um, also, just to, as you said, sort of like documenting um, the the voices that exist now today. Um, Edmund Lynch has just finished a uh, his 300th, or I think it's now 305, uh, recording of interviews with um, the people that, that that you just mentioned um, and several others as well um, that were involved in various different. Uh, movements and historical events over the past few decades in Ireland um, and all of those are going to sit in the National Museum's collection and um, they will they are currently being uh, transcribed and edited to be put up and accessible to anyone who wishes to view them or read the transcripts um, so yeah that is a, a really massive project as Edmund, Edmund's been working on for two three something oh, no. years longer it's actually longer years, sorry yeah. About, yeah way longer um, one so, yeah, thing though so. I would add to that is because mm. those initial interviews that Edmund did we're very focused on very something very specific in a time frame, and I think may need to be relooked at to see those personal histories are broadened out. Maybe you know because obviously the questions were very deliberate around, and I know this because I was the third person interviewed. Nice. But they were very deliberate around a period of time around decriminalisation specifically. Yeah. But those, I think, what Carl was saying was that you know 
the, their, their own personal histories are not being necessarily documented. That's Sorry, point. Richard. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the interviewing work that Edmund has done, but I'd like to just draw attention to the fact that, um, you know, you don't have to be LGBT to go and interview an LGBT person or ally about um, our history, but I do think that historians and PhD students who approach these interviews, and this is from my own personal experience of them, um, need to be aware that this isn't just like any other history. I mean, um, when someone interviews me and they have their list of questions, I typically think, and that's not the question that I would ask me if I was you, you know. Um, and also, I think they show typically a lack of understanding that this history is really personal for us. I mean, when someone asks you about the past, the past for many LGBT people is very painful. And um, um, I think that um, there's a, you know, oral history is quite popular, but I don't think there's an adequate awareness that the people who are telling their stories, that this is just not a mundane activity. And, um, you know, it should be emphasized, you know, you know, maybe you change your mind afterwards and you don't want it to actually be in an archive. It just was maybe that you just want to actually be able to, for the first time in your life, say something. Um, and so there, there's, I think there's greater ethical issues around LGBT history than maybe the case in some other areas of historic inquiry or um, is generally recognized. I think that's also the case. Um, for, uh, personally, anyway, I find the, there's a lot of emotional labor involved in yeah, researching sure. LGBT history, um, which is one of the other, other reasons we set up QCI was a little bit of a support group um, because we needed it. But also in like the work I've done in the gallery, there was a lot of also bringing people along with me. So there was um, like LGBT awareness training I did for staff and volunteers, which was incredible. But again, you're asking say one or two, maybe three individuals to put all of that emotional labor on themselves. Mm. So one thing I always flag with people, if you're doing any of this research yourself, dear God, take time for yourself. Like if you need to walk away from it, do. Because at a certain point I was neck deep in police reports and just, it's, it's very, very difficult. And also quite difficult to explain to um, like my peers in the gallery who are mostly straight and why it was such a toll um, and then having to like take the time away from it for a while. So anyone doing this research, I would say, look after yourself as well. Um, it's quite important. We have another question. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that, um, I'm really enjoying um, the, the discussion. Um, and actually, what you've just been discussing there relates to my question. And I think it's kind of more from um, maybe the Tenny perspective or transgender, because I always feel sometimes that the transgender community get you know, sidelined in these discussions. And it goes back, I think, to the theme of marriage equality. Um, obviously, we want to make equal access to a, an institution, but certainly that, you know, I mean, not everyone wants to get married and there's still issues around social structures and that wonderful queer culture that gay people represented, that, that counterculture. So I, don't, I think a lot of people don't see marriage equality by any means as somehow the promised land. In fact, there's a very strong argument that it may actually be retrograde in terms of heteronormativity and all those buzzwords. But my point was more so kind of linking back to Tenny, which was many of us in that campaign were extremely uncomfortable with the way certain voices were silenced. And as this is public history, and you know we're here talking about you know um, transgender people, um, is it not very? I'm not. I don't overstate this, but is it not very? disappointing that as late as 2015, we are still silencing voices of the LGBT community um, in order to achieve aims, or we feel it necessary to do that. Uh, and it's being done now, not so much, maybe, well, it's being done, or, or perhaps this was always the case, but it was very evident that 
the LGBT community itself silences people within the LGBT community and writes them out of the public history of a particular event, which was that marriage equality referendum. Uh, and you, uh, you know, um, I just maybe want the panel's observations uh, around that um, point. If you don't mind, I'd like to jump on that hobby horses. Um, because for me, uh, like I lived through this, this was, uh, I was part of the gender recognition campaign uh, at the time and we were working really hard because we were part of that original coalition which ended up being Yes Equality. So transgender, or Tenny, as you mentioned, were the fourth member of that group. But after the second meeting, we were removed. We were told, we, we weren't told anything, we were just stopped being invited. Um, and throughout that campaign, while we were still running our gender recognition campaign, there was that silencing where trans voices who were working on the marriage campaign as well, albeit were the only place you would be heard was actually at your local level. In other words, if you were working, for instance, you know, I know in my own locality uh, in Greystones, young Sam Blankensy was quite vocal and he was out. I know, for instance, within the Fine Gael LGBT group, Claire Farrell was still very vocal and, and very out. But I do think that what happened to the trans community through that campaign, and, and I can tell you a lot of stories that would shock most of you, but what actually happened and reflected in actually a lot of our experience through the previous 20, 30 years. You know, if I, I tell a story regularly around uh, the Lesbian Lives Conference in 1995 where trans woman Lydia Foy was actually, and, and those of you should know who Dr. Lydia Foy is, um, who was the person who took, I'm not sure, I'm assuming you do, but the person who took a legal campaign for over 22 years, which eventually resulted in gender recognition. But she was thrown out of that uh, conference back in 1995. There was quite a lot of consternation, a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, and eventually uh, the lesbian community eventually embraced trans women within that community. That has a knock-on effect of how the tra trans women are seen within the lesbian community today, which is really positive, and um, which reflects on what's actually happening in the UK. Where on the other hand, the broader LGBT community actually tends to ignore the trans community generally. And in fact, a lot of our problems are left to the very end. In other words, right now we're going through a chaotic, a disturbing, disrespectful uh, issue with our healthcare. Our healthcare is the most ridiculous, uh, disrespectful, horrific process that is the, probably one of the worst in the world at this point in time. And yet we have one of the most progressive gender recognition uh, campaigns. Yet we don't hear about it. We hear about it within our own community. We hear about it uh, with the argument and the fights that we're trying to have. But in the wider LGBT community, despite the fact that we're trying to talk about it and we're trying to get support for it, it's ignored. So I think, yes, you're right when you say that within the LGBT community, generally, sometimes voices are, um, are silenced. I think it wasn't just the trans community that, that was silenced within the, LG, or within the marriage equality campaign. Those who were different, those who were very much living that queer lifestyle, that counterculture that you mentioned, was also silenced. And, and yes, it was a means to an end. There's no doubt about it. And we reflected that in our own uh, conversations around the fact that it, it got what needed to be got, but ultimately at what cost. And that is still a sore point within the trans community, even today, about how the gay community generally, the LGBT community generally, sees the trans community within it, whether it is still fully part of that community or not. And I don't know whether I've answered it, because I could still go on here for another <laughs> two hours going on about it. Sorry. Can I just say that, you know, let's say in 20 years' time, and historians are looking back at that campaign, they may be able to put it into a wider perspective because, um, yes, LG, you know, the community could have behaved differently and better towards more marginal minority groups in the community. But the context was, and where blame lies, is a society which already had so much homophobia and transphobia 
a state which said that during the campaign we were going to unleash the forces of homophobia and transphobia by giving them 50% of the airtime. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think if, in terms of responsibility, I don't think responsibility should be laid primarily at, within the LGBT community, but put, put it where it belongs, which we you know, which, which, which um, was in, you know, why did we even have to go before the people for a referendum. So this is Lord, oh, wasn't it wonderful that people affirmed? This was a horrible period of my life, that campaign. And I said, why didn't the government put it to the Supreme Court and at least see, was it possible that we didn't have to go through a referendum? In fact, um, you know, the, those questions around the damage that was done to people by being forced to go through this process, I think we've lost sight of that. Um, and these are questions which historians should pick up, you know. Are we asking the right questions about what went on in the campaign? Yeah, I think it's probably a much wider debate and conversation yeah. around that about why did we ever get to that point? Why were we put through that position? Um, I'm conscious of time, yeah, so that's I was just about to. Has anybody got one more question or? Yeah. Hello. Um, I was wondering, uh, you, you, well, you made reference to perhaps there have been some more visibility um, in terms of the queer community in Ireland in the 19th century as opposed to the 20th and I could be totally ignorant here but um, I'm wondering has there been any work done to try and understand where maybe I know a lot of the oppression is kind of levelled at the church but where there may have been an intersection between say kind of non, I suppose, like Irish culture in general and where that came to maybe meet the church as well in terms of generating this culture of repression that dominated for most of the 20th century out there. Would you like to take that up? It's a complex one. <laughs> I didn't quite hear it. So the degree to which that the, from the 19th century onwards, the culture of repression in our society was could not just simply be out of the church's door, but where a broader Irish society came to meet the church, right? So it's sort of, um, who is culpable in the history of repression? That's a fancy question, because that's also come up in relation to the experience of other people in Irish society, mm -hmm. including those who were, um, you know, forced to, 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 to give up their, um, of their children. And it would be very easy just to say it was the institution. Mm. But of course, you know, our ancestors and family members and some of ourselves were also part of those institutions. So I, I don't think there's going to be an easy answer saying, oh, it was the church or it was the parents because there was a symbiotic relationship between them. Mm. But it's a question that isn't just unique to LGBT experience, but to that of other sections of society, particularly those who have experience of, you know, modern laundries, reform schools. And we may, we may be able to learn from how they handle those questions when we come to adopt them in our own history. Yeah, I think it's important as well to look at the history of resistance because our society is, is not, across the centuries, entirely a passive society. There are yeah. always communities. And actually, I think it's very important in looking at queer history because... Um, LGBTQ plus people generally found themselves within those communities. So for me, you know, a kind of a general maxim is if I want to find people doing interesting things in the 19th century, I look at Quakers. In the 20th century, I look at communists. I look at the, the Theosophical Society as well, which is really important to LGBTQ plus identities. And it's also looking at those kind of communities and who they articulated as the, who are the axes of, of oppression. Um, and pointing out uh, intersections and, and how these things were intertwined. One thing that I've been thinking a lot about recently as well is kind of, of race and Irishness in, in these periods. People like, we often commemorate Frederick Douglass's visit to Ireland, but actually Frederick Douglass talked about the oppression of the church in Ireland as well. Mm. It's interesting that someone with that kind of view of politics would articulate that. So yeah, um, I absolutely agree that there is an element to which Irish society meets the church in, in that axis of oppression, I guess you'd say. And if we want to articulate it, we can look at the history of resistance to us and how those people are angling themselves against us. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and I know we're, 
we're way over it. We, we expect it to be way over it. Um, but uh, thank you so much, everybody. And hopefully, I, I appreciate that probably doesn't answer your last question. But uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done there um, still. So just first of all, thank you all for coming today. Uh, it was wonderful to have a live audience again, rather than having to do this across Zoom, as we've been doing for the past year and a half. Um, but I'd just like to thank the other panelists. First of all, Kate Renan, Morris Casey, and Richard O'Leary. And I'm Sarah Phillips, and thank you all for coming. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's the last of our uh, in-person events here at Dublin Castle, and uh, we couldn't have chosen a, a better way to finish it. A really fantastic conversation, and thank you so much for your involvement uh, and for all the people who are watching online. Uh, we do have two more events in the festival. Just give me a second to mention them. At 5 p.m., Dr. Mary McAuliffe will present If She Was a Man, She Would Have Been Shot. It's a, a, a talk about women's surveillance and punishment during the Irish War of Independence. And at 7.30 p.m. we end our festival with an online event featuring Andrew Roberts talking to Lisa Marie Griffith about his new biography of George III, and there will be some uh, plenty of Irish uh, feature in that as well. And full details are all on the Dublin Festival of History.ie website. So look, just to conclude, I'd like to thank the team at Dublin Castle. Uh, I'd like to thank the events crew in the blue T-shirts who didn't interrogate you too strongly, I hope, looking for your COVID search. They did a great job. Thank them. Uh, Dave and his film crew made the... All of you look beautiful on uh, the internet, I can assure you, so uh, that was good. And uh, I particularly want to thank all of the, uh, my colleagues in the City Libraries and the Culture Company team who put together such a fantastic festival in less than ideal circumstances because we were weighing up, are we doing real life, are we doing online, and we ended up doing the blend. But I particularly wanted to thank two people who, I don't know if they're in the room, but Kate Chandler and Joey Kavanagh, between the two of them, they did most to make this festival happen. I really want to thank them, and well done, you did a great job. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we look forward to seeing you uh, back at the Dublin Festival of History in 2022. But please join me in thanking our speakers, Sarah Phillips, Richard O'Leary, Morris Casey and Kate Renan. Thank you.